I really think you're going to enjoy it. Before we get started, I would like to thank a few people for making this show happen. Firstly, thank you to our sponsors, Cactus Cantina, The Cat's Meow, Dilly Dally, DR Horton, Fairhope Realty Group, Mr. Jeans Beans, Section Street Pizza, Smart Bank, and Dr. Tiffany Bielholm and family. Your generosity in sponsoring the theater department is greatly appreciated. Thank you to our drama mamas for providing delicious meals and snacks to us this week. <laughs> thank you to Peyton Rogers for designing our posters. Thank you to Dilly Dally slash the Cat's Meow for our gorgeous actual antique 1800s couch. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you to Bayshore Christian Schools Theater Department for the use of their bench. And thank you to Goodwill for our picture frames. And a special thank you to Cody Rawlinson, who is our dance instructor here. Uh, he did our choreography for the show, and I gave him very vague instructions of, I want a waltz, and delivered far beyond my expectations. Lastly, I want to thank my student director, Tu Pilcher, who helped keep me steady during this whole process. Also, Catherine McKinney. to your time, I see. Very glad indeed. Delighted. Have the pleasure of seeing you here at Longbourn. The Prince of Longbourn, eh? Great. Allow me to make you acquainted with my daughters. Come along, Jane. Miss Jane Bennett. The eldest. Though I cannot see why she must always have the chair nearest the window. Oh, hush, Lydia. And the prettiest of all. Now, for goodness sake. The next, Elizabeth. Wittiest of all. But then Captain Tally of the regiment once expressed her to be the most critical of the young lady in Hertfordshire. In the only And as always, Mary. The proudest. Pride is a very common failing, I believe. By all that I have ever read, I am convinced that it is very common indeed, and that there are very few of us who do not cherish a feeling of self complacency on a score of some quality or other, real or imaginary. Vanity and pride are different things, though the words are often used synonymously. A person may be proud without being vain. Pride relates more to our opinion of ourselves, vanity is what we would have others think of us. Well, yes, quite so. <laughs> Last and least, the two youngest, Kitty and Lydia. Are we to be only the youngest? Have we no qualities? We are the best dancers with the prettiest hats. And sing most charmingly. Well, I do. <laughs> My dear Mr. Bennett. Mr. Bennett, to be sure. My dear Mr. Bennett, have you had the Netherfield Park and let it last? I have not. Oh, but it is for Mrs. Long has just been there. She has told me all about it. Probably an elderly bachelor with a king. Indeed, Mr. Bennett, do not you want to know who is taking it? You want to tell me, and I have no objection to hearing it. Mrs. Long says that Netherfield is taken by a young man of large fortune, and he came down on Monday and was so delighted with it that he is to take possession before a mingle with Mary or single. We must first inquire of the gentleman's name, Lydia. <laughs> Bingley? But Mary or single? No, single, my dear, so we share a single man of large fortune for all five thousand a year. It is a truth universally acknowledged that the single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Well, did you know the feelings or views of such a man may be? This truth is so well fixed into the minds of the surrounding families that he's considered the rightful property of someone or others of their daughters. Uh, dear. Hush, Lizzie. What's a fine thing for our girls? 
How so? That he might marry one of us, Papa. And is that his design in settling here? Oh, design? Nonsense. But it's not unusual for a young man to fall in love. So he must be a soldier in a regimental jacket. You will wait on him, of course. I see no occasion for that. You and the girls may know, or better yet, send them by themselves for you are as handsome as them all, Mr. Bingley Malik, you the best of the party. Well, <laughs> I certainly have my share of beauty, but when a woman has five grown up doctors, she ought to give over ideas of her own attraction. In such cases, a woman has not much beauty to think of. But perhaps <laughs> only your daughters. Think what an establishment it would be for one of them. You must go visit Mr. Bingley, but it will be impossible for us to if you do not. You are over scrupulous, Shirley. I will send a few lines by you to assure him of my. Party consent in marrying whichever he chooses. Mr. Bennett! You take delight in vexing me! You have no compassion on my poor nerves! My dear, I have high respect for your nerves. They are my old friends. <laughs> you do not know what I suffer! But I hope you will get over it and live to see many men of 4,000 a year come into the neighborhood. Uh, it would not help if 20 such should come since you will not visit them! Depend upon it, my dear, for when there are 20, I will visit them all. <laughs> Despite his protestations, Papa was among the earliest of those that waited on Mr. Bingley. Captain Olivia, hope Mr. Bingley will like it. We are not in the way to know what Mr. Bingley likes since you will not visit. <laughs> it isn't fair, Papa! Then it isn't! You forget that we shall meet him at the assemblies that Mrs. Long has promised to introduce him. I do not believe Mrs. Long will do any such thing. She has two nieces of her own and plain is capable of both of them. She is a selfish, hypocritical woman and I have no opinion. <laughs> uh, but let us return to Mr. Bingley. And I say I am sick of Mr. Bingley! My dear, why did you not tell me so before? If I had known as much this morning, I certainly would not have called on him. Ah! Called on him? Oh, Papa! Charlie, Father! I have seen girls with an excellent father you have, but I knew I could persuade you at last. <laughs> yes, and I fear as I have actually paid the visit, we cannot escape his acquaintance now. <laughs> Bennett, might you consider a stroll about the 
receipt of an invitation from... My dear friend, if you are not so compassionate to dine today with me, we shall be in danger of hating each other for the rest of our lives. <laughs> from as soon as you can on receipt of this, we shall dine with my brother, as, as well, well as, as other gentlemen, gentlemen and sundry officers. Yours ever, Caroline B. But sundry officers? Did Kitty now go to Mama? Who should like to meet sundry officers? Am I mistaken that there was but one name on the invitation? <laughs> <laughs> May I have the carriage, Father? Of course. Indeed not. It would be much better for you to go on horseback, for the weather looks ill, and you might have the good fortune to be thoroughly soaked to say long go with the mean leaves in hell. <laughs> Mars hopes were answered. They are not to be gone long when it's rain for us. <coughs> that was a lucky idea of mine, indeed. <laughs> but you leave! This will never feel like me. My dearest Lizzie, I find myself very unwell this morning, for I suppose it's to be imputed of my getting mud through yesterday. The Bingleys were not here in my returning home to my infanta. Though accepting a sore throat and headache, there is not much the matter with me. Yours, Jane. Well, my dear, if your daughter should have dangerous fit of illness and die, <laughs> it would be a comfort to know that it was only pursued of Mr. Bingley and under your orders. <laughs> <laughs> Nonsense! People do not die of trifling a little cold. Plus, Mr. Bennet, the inconvenience is worth the prize. She feels ill, and I would go to her. Is this a hint to me, Lizzie, to send for the horses? The horses are wanted on the farm. I will walk. The distance is nothing when one has a motive. You cannot go jumping over stiles and arrive in dirty stockings. Jane Astley will forgive me, Mother. Mr. Bennet! Miss <laughs> uh, Bennet, how remarkably good of you to come. Pleasure, of course, Mr. Bingley. You can imagine my sister's letter gave me some cause for concern. Of course. I wish I could answer that concern more favorably. Your sister has slept ill, and though it's up, it's not well enough to leave her room. I will take you to her. Lizzie! Oh, Jane, you are flushed! Should not you be in bed? We have sent for the apothecary. I would be most grateful, Miss Bennet, should you stay in Netherfield until your sister is quite well. Yes, do stay. I will dispatch a servant to acquaint you and your family with any necessities. Mr. Bingley, I cannot attempt to thank you. Thanks are far beyond the occasion. Believe me, I have no pleasure in this world superior to that of contributing to you. Well, he is most attentive. You look quite jaw, Jane. But I must, must say, it serves you exactly for falling in with Mother's advice. <laughs> Lizzie, how did you get here? The horses were commandeered, so I walked. Through the mud. Through the mud, yes. Such manners and so accomplished for her age. 
is amazing to me how so many young ladies can be so accomplished as they all are. Oh, my dear Charles, what do you mean? Yes, Caroline. Oh, <coughs> I've never been introduced to a young lady without first being told of how very accomplished she is. I fear I cannot boast of knowing more than half a dozen in the whole range of my acquaintance that are really accomplished. <laughs> then you must comprehend a great deal on your idea of an accomplished woman. She must have a thorough knowledge of music, singing, drawing, dancing, languages, and a certain something in her air and manner, the tone of her voice, her addresses and expressions, all the women we would have to say. And to all this, she must add something more substantial in the improvement of her mind by extensive reading. <laughs> I am now not surprised you knowing only six accomplished women. I rather wonder if you know any. I say, sister, could you take this piano forte paper home with a lively scotch air?
sincerity in accepting your sister's kind invitation with an almost unbecoming alacrity. It is a great kindness to see this out. The regiment I hope is not unhappy quarters here. <coughs> I cannot speak for the regiment, but may I say, I am personally improved by acquaintance with your family. A courtesy very prettily put. And sincerely meant. I cannot have noticing, sir, such an incumbrous of a guard passing between yourself and Mr. Darcy. You have a keen eye, Miss Elizabeth. And a curious one, sir. Might I ask how far Netherfield is from Meryton? Three miles, perhaps. And how long has Darcy been staying About a month. He's a man of very large property in Derbyshire, I understand. His estate there is a noble one. In fact, I have been connected with his family from my infancy. Are you much acquainted with him? I have spent four days in the same house with him, and I find him very disagreeable. I do believe your opinion of him would, in general, astonish. Really? He is not at all liked in Hertfordshire. May I express surprise? The world is perhaps blinded by his fortune and consequence, and sees him only as he chooses to be seen. I might take him even on my slight acquaintance as an ill-tempered man. I fear I have considerable knowledge of him. The elder Darcy, his father, was excessively attached to him. I cannot do justice to his kindness. My father was his father's estate manager. His son and I were born into the same parish, sharing the same amusements. And the elder Darcy knew that the church ought to be my profession, and promised me the family parish when it became available, or if not, a voluntary promise to provide for me. Both of those were countermanded by young Darcy after his father's death. On what grounds? Had the elder Darcy liked me less, his son may have bored me better, but his father's uncommon attachment to me irritated me. He had not the temper to bear in the sort of competition of which we see. In short, his behavior to me has been scandalous, but I cannot be fair to him now. I do not thought Mr. Darcy as bad as this. I must owe almost all his actions to be traced to his considerable pride. But can such abominable pride as his ever done him good? He is liberal and generous, displayed hospitality, assists his tenants and relieves the poor. Family pride and filial pride have done this. But his father's preference for me pricked that pride and made him my enemy. I'm astonished at his intimacy with Mr. Beamley. Do you know him? Not at all. He is a sweet-tempered, amiable, charming man. He cannot know what Mr. Darcy is. Mr. Darcy can please where he chooses. He does not want his abilities. My judgment would be that he deserves to be publicly disgraced. <laughs> he will be sometime or other, but it shall not be by me. Miss Elizabeth, due to the troubling aspect of the subject, you have not been a whit less delightful. I must suppose that the relations you have just described will not allow your presence to come in to Netherfield. I would fear discomfort for all involved, but may no mistake me. I keenly feel the loss. Well, whatever he said was well said, and whatever he did was done gracefully. <laughs> but dear sister, I am all astonishment and concern. I knew not how to believe Mr. Darcy could be so unworthy of Mr. Bingley's regard. I can much more easily believe Mr. Bingley's being imposed on than Mr. Wickham who could create such a history for himself. But it is so distressing. One does not know what to think. <coughs> I beg your pardon. One knows exactly what to think. I know only with certainty that poor Mr. Bingley would have much to suffer if Wickham's charge becomes public. Poor Mr. Bingley. <laughs> I speak only as an observer. Back at home, Mr. Bingley and his sister came to give their personal invitation for the long-expected bowl of Netherfield, which was fixed for the following Tuesday. Well, Mr. Collins... I am by no means of the opinion, I assure you, that a bowl of this kind to my young man of character can have any evil tendency. And I am so far from objecting to dancing myself that I take this opportunity, Miss Elizabeth, of soliciting the first two dances with you especially. <laughs> and it struck me. But I had been selected from among my sisters as worthy of being the mistress of Hunsford Parsonage. <laughs> <laughs>
dancing. I've always seen a great similarity in the turn of our minds, Mr. Darcy. We both come from an unsocial, taciturn disposition, unwilling to speak unless we expect to face the whole room and be passed out to all the posterity in a part of the parlor. This is no striking in terms of the serial character. On the other piece of mind, I can't pretend to say you think that they would push that down, please. Mr. Wickham is blessed with such happy manners as to enjoy his making friends. Whether he may be equally capable of retaining them is less certain. <laughs> so unlucky as to lose your friendship, and in a manner which he is likely to suffer from all his life. What do you think of books, Miss Elizabeth? I cannot speak of books in a ballroom. My head is full of something else. I remember hearing you say, Mr. Darcy, that you hardly ever forgave, and that your resentment, once created, was unappeasable. You're very cautious. I perceive as to its being created. I am. And never allow yourself to be blinded by the prejudice. I ask what these questions to him. Merely to the illustration of your character. I'm trying to make it out. And what is your success? Do not get on at all. I hear such different accounts of you as the cause of being seemingly. I can really believe that the cause of your great respect in Elizabeth. And I would hope you would not take the sketch by the character at present. And if we put it in the report, I will on either. Ah, Mr. Darcy. <laughs> Lady Catherine de Berg, who has secured for me my living at Huntsford Parsonage. Thus, allow me to observe that I consider the clerical office as equal in point of dignity with the highest rank in the kingdom, provided that a proper humility and behavior is at the same time maintained. You have forgotten your name, sir. Right? <laughs> Mr. Collins, sir. Good light. Excellent, most excellent. I have no reason to believe I have to be dissatisfied with my reception. He answered me with the utmost civility, and upon the whole, I am very much pleased with him. Though he neglected his name. Did he? <laughs> so, Mr. Eliza, I hear you are quite delighted with George Wickham. Oh, yes, this is Sir Jane who's been talking with me. Did you know he was the son of Lady Mr. Darcy Stewart? I believe he's so asserted. Well, let me recommend you, however, as a friend, not to give him the same confidence to all his assertions. As to Mr. Darcy's using a mill, it is perfectly false. But on the contrary, he has always been remarkably kind to him. Well, I would guess. George Wickham has treated Mr. Darcy in a most infamous manner. I do not know the particulars, but his coming into the country at all is an insolent thing. Considering his distance, one could not expect much better. His guilt and his distance appear by your account to be one and the same, for you have accused him of nothing more than being the son of Mr. Darcy's late steward. And for that, I can assure you, he has informed me himself. I beg your pardon, please. Under your instruction, sir. That is promise is the felicity in which a true marriage of affection can bestow. Ah, oh, Miss Bingley. Ah, oh, I <laughs> should have <laughs> the advantages of such a match. Mama! Such an advantage living with the wee of our own. Sadly, our carriage Such a waits. comfort knowing how fond you are of Jane. And we must go. Ah, uh, 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 Miss Elizabeth, it is a great shame we put it in the <laughs>
sentence a bit too marked and mistaken. But before I run away with my feelings, I shall enumerate my regrets for them. <laughs> First, to set the example of matrimony in my parish. Of course! Secondly, it greatly adds to a man's well-being. And thirdly, by the particular advice and recommendation of Lady Catherine de Burke, my esteemed patrons. Better be an active, useful sort of person. <laughs> and a stolen one for a long way. And there he went. Now, you may observe, that cousin. <laughs> <laughs> I do not reckon the notice of Lady Catherine the least of my advantages. Your wit and vivacity, I think, must be acceptable to her. <laughs> Especially when tempered with the silence and respect which her rank invariably excites. Mm. And fourthly, as I am to inherit this estate after the death of your honored father, <laughs> I feel it incumbent to choose a wife from among his daughters so that the loss to them might be as great as possible. <laughs> and now, Miss Elizabeth, nothing remains but for me to assure you, in the most animated language, I But as to fortune, I'm perfectly indifferent. And as to dowry, I'm well aware of your father's finances, and I can assure you that no ungenerous reproach shall ever pass my lips when we are married. No! <laughs> no! No! no. 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 Very aware of the honor of your proposals, Mr. Collins, but it is not it's impossible for me to decline then. Well, it's usual for young ladies to, to at first reject the addresses of the men they secretly need to accept. I can assure you I'm not one of those elegant females. I'm a rational creature speaking the truth from a heart. I will not have you. Can I speak plainer? <laughs> Uniform in <laughs> Dear Mr. Collins, allow me to be the first to congratulate you. She has begun delightfully with a refusal. A refusal? Mr. 
Mr. Darcy is impatient to see his younger sister. And to confess the truth, we are scarcely less eager to see her again. Georgiana has no equal for beauty, elegance, and accomplishments. And we dare to entertain the hope of her being here after all sister. Foolishness, she's a child. He said not near enough. He said not express to declare that Caroline neither expects nor wishes me to be her sister, and that she is perfectly convinced of her brother's indifference to me. Can there be any other opinion on the subject? Yes, there can, for mine is totally different. We hear it. Most willing. It is this. Miss Bingley sees that her brother is in love with you and wants him to marry Georgiana Darcy. I also suspect that he is further surpassed by his friend Mr. Darcy's interference. He watched you most narrowly as you danced. But you must not criticize Lizzie. Perhaps I have imagined Mr. Bingley's regard. I mean, fancy admiration means more than it does. Then take care that it should. His sister has influence him as well, Jane, in conjunction with his friend. Surely she only wishes his happiness. <laughs> she may wish many things besides his happiness, such as an increase in wealth, consequences, and great connections. No, I think no ill of him or his sister. So let me take it in the light, in the best light, in the light in which it may be understood, and at least have the comfort that it has been no more than ever fancy on my side. And it has done no harm to anyone but myself. You are too good. You wish to find the whole world respectable. The more I see the world, the more I'm dissatisfied with it. And every day confirms my belief of the inconsistency <laughs> of all human characters. I have come to distrust the appearance of either merit or sense. You must not hinder your happiness on my behalf. <laughs> So, Lizzie, your sister's crossed in love, I find. I congratulate her. Next to being married, a girl likes to be crossed in love every now and then. <laughs> you will not long bear to be outdone by Jane. There are officers enough at Meryton to disappoint all the young ladies in the country. But let Wickham be your man. He is a pleasant fellow who would jilt you credibly. Thank you, sir, but a less agreeable man would satisfy me. And not all expect Jane's good fortune. <laughs> Amazement! Within a week, and as in a short time as Mr. Collins' long speeches would allow, all was settled between him and Charlotte Lucas by way, but by way of domestic arrangement, and Lizzie feels she accepted him solely from the pure and disinterested desire and establishment. And as Mama said, Mr. Wickham, 
But I do find in the most agreeable man I ever saw, wise. <laughs> but how can I be wiser than so many of my fellow creatures if I am tempted? Or how am I even to know it would be wisdom to resist? All that I can promise you, therefore, is not to be in a hurry. I say no more. I shall take Jane with me to London as a change of scene might be of service to the poor girl. I understand you want to visit the Collins in their newly married state, and you must visit me as well. Not for two, Colonel Fitzwilliam, in all quarters. 
Miss Elizabeth, your family? My family. How many sisters have you, Miss Elizabeth? I have four other sisters. That is a great many. Are you the eldest? I'm the second. Are your sisters handsome? Indeed. Your sisters play and sing. Do you draw? No. None at all. That's very odd. Has your governess left you? We never had a governess. No governess. How is that possible? Five daughters brought about a home without a governess. <laughs> I never heard of such a thing. Your mother must have been quite a slave to your education. Not perhaps as you might think. <laughs> and who taught you? Who attended you? Such of us as wished to learn certainly had the means. Books were always provided, and those who chose to be idle certainly might. I know doubt, but that is exactly what a governess will prevent. And I know your mother would have most strenuously advised you to engage in one. Miss Elizabeth, are any of your sisters out? Uh, yes, ma'am. All. All. All five at once. Very odd. The young ones out before the eldest are married. <laughs> really, ma'am, I think it would be very hard upon younger sisters that they should not have their share of society amusement because the elder has no means and inclination to marry early. Upon my word, you give your opinion very decidedly. Pray, what is your age? Three younger sisters grown up, your ladyship can hardly expect me to own it. Fitzwilliam, <laughs> what is that you are saying? What are you telling Miss Elizabeth? Um, we are simply speaking of music, madam. Of music, then pray speak aloud. <laughs> <laughs> and simply reminding Miss Bennet of her promise to Pray for us at the pianoforte. Ah, uh, yes. Pray excuse me. I fear you will not find me a great proficient. Uh, pray continue your conversation rather than attend to me. I often tell young ladies, Miss Elizabeth, that you know, excellence in music can be acquired without constant practice. Be defied to me, Mr. Darcy, but my courage always rises with every attempt to intimidate me. You would not really believe I am entertained you inside of a long view. Ah, the pleasure of taking long enough to know you take great enjoyment in professing a piano which is not a fact or own. Your cousin will give you a very pretty notion of me and teach you not to believe a word I say. Take care, sir, for you are provoking me to retaliate, and such things may come as shock as your relations to hear. I'm afraid of you. Pray, let me hear what you accuse him of. I should like to know how a paragon behaves among strangers. You shall hear then, but prepare for something very dreadful. My first time seeing him was at a ball, and he refused to dance, and more than one young lady was sitting down in one of the parts now. I am not the owner of acquaintance with a lady in attendance, and I am no qualified to recommend myself to strangers. Shall we ask him why a man of sense and education in the world is ill-qualified to recommend himself to strangers? I have not the talent of conversing easily with those I have ever met before. Fortunately, for all present, that is not the case here. <coughs> <laughs>
if she has true Darcy spirit, she might like to have her own way. In fact, she's one of the most tractable creatures I have ever met, and a great favorite of Miss Bingley. I heard you know of her. Yes, a little. Darcy is uncommonly kind to Bingley, and takes a pride in the steel of care. From something Darcy said, I believe Bingley very much indebted to him. It is a circumstance you could not want generally know, because but to get around to the lady's family it would be a most unpleasant thing. You may, of course, depend on my not mentioning it. It is merely that Tarsi congratulated himself on saving a friend from the most inconveniences of a most imprudent marriage, and I can only assume that friend to be Bingley, as his open nature might get him into a scrape of that sort. I beg your pardon, but I do not see what right Mr. Darcy had to decide on the propriety of a friend's inclination. Perhaps strong objections to the lady's family. One was a country tunny, and another of a mercantile background, perhaps an unsuitable mother. But this is all conjecture. Good day to you, Miss Elizabeth. <laughs> Jane herself, there could be no possibility of objection, our loveliness and goodness as she is. Neither could anything be urged against my father, though, with some peculiarities, as abilities Mr. Darcy himself may not disdain. Of course, my mother. But Mr. Darcy would see the deeper world from his want of importance in his friend's inclination than from their want of sense. He has been governed by the worst kind of pride, and partly for retaining Mr. Bingley for his sister. Miss Elizabeth. Darcy! I have come to. May I inquire of your help? My help? <laughs> we have not seen each other these past few days, and I have come to inquire of your help. My help, Mr. Darcy, meets all the usual standards. Ah. Yes. Ah. In vain I have struggled. It will not do. My feelings will not be repressed. You must allow me to tell you how honorably I admire and love you. <laughs> I see I dismay you. I have been slow, dilatory even. I should prepare myself in early date. But there were, of course, the family obstacles to which judgment always opposed the inclination. The general sense of your social inferiority, other deeming the obligations of the line. I could not forget my responsibility to an estate, a way of life, a private place which might, given your circumstances, disinclude you. And thus the very agency I described to place against my will, and reason, or rather, against my character, in an in inclination. But the very strength of my attachment made it impossible to conquer my feelings. And I can only express the hope that we will now be rewarded by your acceptance at my hand. There. <laughs> I have spoken of it meanwhile, Miss Elizabeth. In such cases as this, it is, I believe, the established mode to express a sense of obligation for the sentiments about, however unequally they may be returned. It is natural to feel obligation. If I could feel gratitude, I would now thank you. But I cannot. I have never desired a good opinion. You have bestowed it most unbelievably. The feelings which you have described to move your acknowledgement has not affected me. In this is all the reply to which I have, have the honor of expecting. I might as well so with their visibility, I am thus rejected. And I might as well imply why, with so evident a design, you chose to tell me. You liked me against your will, against your reason, and even against your character? Was this not some excuse for incivility if I was uncivil? But I have other provocations. You know I have. Do you think that any consideration would tempt me to accept the man who's been once the means of ruining, perhaps, forever, the happiness of a beloved sister? You detached Mr. Bingley and Jane from each other, or at least yours was the principal means by it, involving them both in misery of the acutest kind. Can you deny that you've done it? I have no wish to deny that I did everything in my power to separate my friend from your sister, or that I rejoice in my success. Towards him, I have been kind of towards myself. Quite clearly said. But it is not merely this affair which my dislike is founded. Your character was unfolded in the recital I received many months ago from Mr. Wicker. You take it again, you should have his concerns. Knowing his misfortunes, he would not take an interest. His misfortunes! And of your infliction, you have bestowed it most unwittingly. And this is your opinion of me? I... I must... The mode of your declaration has not affected me, Mr. Darcy. You are the last man in the world whom I could ever be prevailed upon to marry. You have said quite enough, madam. I can't comprehend your feelings. Forgive me for taking up so much of your time. Accept my best wishes for your health and happiness.
leave on my favorite walk. <laughs> I've been wanting to for some time. Would you do me honor reading this letter? Two offenses you last night laid to my charge. First, that I had detached Mr. Bingley from his sister, and the other, that I had in defiance of honor blasted the prospects of Mr. Wickham. Ah, uh, Miss Elizabeth, you are well known in Hertfordshire. <laughs> I have not been long in Hertfordshire. It's finished. But you think me too forward if I apply for a second dance? Before I observed my friend's behavior, perceived his most surprising partiality. Your sister, I also observed. And though her manners were open and engaging, there was no symptom of one regard of sentiment. She received his attentions, but remained to my eye indifferent. My objections to the marriage to other causes of repugnance, your family's want of propriety, betrayed by your mother's manners, your younger sister's forwardness, and even forgiving your father's misplaced wit, all confirmed my sense. Then I must preserve my friend of the most unhappy connection. In London, I found his sister's uneasy. Has been greatly excited. That we were alike sensible. That no, no time, time should be lost in the tragedy. <laughs> Bingley has great natural modesty, with a stronger dependence on my judgment than on his own. To convince him here to see himself was not difficult. On, on this, this subject, I have nothing, nothing more to say, say no apology, apology to offer. With regard to that other, more weighty accusation of having injured Mr. Wickham, that I will attempt to refute. In short, his behavior to me has been scandalous. My father was a fully qualified son of society, but I hope the church of his profession. And intended to provide him in it. He would situate him at the family parsonage and provide him a legacy of one thousand pounds. On my father's death, Mr. Wickham wrote to inform me that I have resolved not to pursue a church living, but to study law for which the thousand pounds would be insufficient. I hope you not think it unreasonable of me to expect a more immediate pecuniary advantage. The business was soon settled. He soon resigned all claim to assist him from the church. He accepted to return three thousand pounds. Three years later, he applied to me again, being then again resolved to be ordained. This must be false. This cannot be. Mr. Wickham assured me his circumstances were exceedingly bad. Indeed, this is only an assertion, yet every line confuses my belief in Mr. Darcy's infamy. You could hardly blame me, Mr. Elizabeth, for refusing his entreaty, and his resentment was so great. You betray your father's wishes and your own honor, sir. That every appearance of acquaintance was dropped. Last summer, he again most painfully obtruded on my notice. My sister Georgiana, for whom Mr. Fitzwilliam and myself were both mutual guardians, was taken out of school from which and established in London. Mr. Wickham, by connivance, recommended himself to her. Miss Darcy, it is a pleasure to renew your acquaintance. She was then but fifteen and was persuaded to believe herself in love and consented to an elopement. Fortunately, regarding me with a second father, she confessed to me her plans. I can I imagine what I felt and how I acted. I wrote to Mr. Wickham in an undisguised heat, and he left London immediately and alone. His object was undoubtedly my sister's inheritance of thirty thousand pounds, <laughs> and hope, I think, to revenge himself upon me. In this light, his attentions to Miss King seem now to be solely and hatefully mercenary. This, madam, is a faithful recreation of all the events that have transpired. If you will. A portion of money makes me makes my assertion valueless. I urge you to Colonel Fitzwilliam, who is himself guardian of Georgiana and is familiar with every particular described above. I would only add, add, God bless you. How humiliating is this discovery! Can't tell just the humiliation. Had I been in love, I could not have been more wretchedly blind. Vanity, not love, has been my folly. As to the mention of my family in terms so mortifying, my sense of shame is severe. But the charge strikes you forcibly for any denial. That defects, I fear, some purpose of any remedy. My mother forces herself beyond all expectation, while my father does nothing to restrain the giddiness and self-willed carelessness of my younger sisters. Only except dear Jane might I call them all but ignorant, idle, and vain. How despicably I have acted. I, who frightened myself on my own descent. To this moment, I never knew myself.
fascination around our domestic circle. Lydia has promised to write very often, but her letters are always very short. Where such and such officers have attended them. And how she had purchased another new gown and another new parasol. <laughs> and more to the lake with the gardeners was the object of my happiest thoughts. Dear Elizabeth, our plans due to Mr. Gardner's business must be somewhat curtailed to an extent. We must give up the lakes and substitute for more contracted talk. Had you set your heart on seeing the lakes? Well, I own their own attraction. I'm afraid we can find a Derbyshire, though it gives us the pleasures of Woolwick, Kenilworth, Lambton, and of course, Pimberley. Oh, Pimberley, the Darcy estate. Yes, I recall. If it were merely a fine house richly furnished, I should not care for it myself. But the grounds are delightful. The grounds, yes. Is not the family down for the summer? Indeed not, you goose, for they summer always in London. Elizabeth! Dearest daughter, 
The meetings and introductions suggested by Mr. Darcy took place two days following and excited my lively attention. I had conceived, you might say, a suspicion, which on the occasion grew to a full conviction that Mr. Darcy or my niece knew. One knew what it was to love. By Lisa's invitations, I was a little in doubt, but the man's overflowing with admiration was evident enough. Thus, dearest Jane, speaking of your supposed rival with Miss Darcy, I saw no look between her and Mr. Bingley that spoke of any particular regard. He also asked me with great interest if all my sisters were still at Longbourn, which I took as an inquiry to married state. Miss Bingley continues in a dislike towards me, and Georgiana Darcy was gracefully civil, but very shy. Something come for you, miss. Thought you might be wanting it? News from Jane and most welcome. Brought it to you, then. Dearest Lizzie, Colonel Forster has informed us that Lydia has run to Scotland with one of his officers. And to confess the truth, Lizzie, it is with Wickham. Worse still, imprudent as a marriage between our poor Lydia and Mr. Wickham would be. We are now frantic to be assured it has taken place at all, for we now know they have got them to Scotland, but to London. And there is reason to believe <laughs> that he never intended to marry Lydia at all. And Colonel Forster. Miss Wickham is not a man to be trusted. Father is going to London with Colonel Forster to discover her, and what he means to do, I know not. Well, he shall shoot the scoundrel through the heart, and we shall all be ruined. <laughs> Ha, <laughs> 
Well, Lydia Werner is saying that if we knew where she was going. Yeah, you would love. What a great joke it will be when I write to Mama and sign my name, Lydia Wickham. <laughs> <laughs>
Lizzie, really, if you are indeed so innocent and ignorant, I must be more explicit. Yeah. Mrs. Mm -hmm. Darcy called on Mr. Gardner to tell him he had indeed found where Wickham and your sister were. He professed it was owing to himself that Wickham's worthlessness had not been well known. He called it his duty to remedy the evil course, not to be complied with Lydia. Lydia, indeed. Mr. Darcy called on her, but she was resolved on remaining. Lydia would be Lydia still. Mr. Darcy asked Mr. Wickham why he did not marry your sister at once. Because we are not rich. Indeed. Wickham still cherished the hope of marrying his fortune in some other country. Mr. Darcy then settled upon him a large sum. I knew it! He made Mr. Garner acquainted with it. Lizzie, where are you going? To speak with father! This Lizzie must go no further than yourself or Jane at most. Mr. Darcy wants neither the sum or the act name. But you have told me. I have, yes. You do, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Enough that does not follow that the interference shall be unwelcome. I would be truly sorry indeed if it were. I find from your aunt you have seen Pemberley. And you've spoken to the old housemaid, I suppose. And what did she say? <laughs> that she had gone into the army and was afraid had not turned out well. Indeed. Has Darcy introduced you to his sister? He has. And do you like her? Very much. <laughs> I hope she will turn out well. Oh, I dare say she will. She has got over the most trying age. <laughs> How should you like making sermons? Exceedingly well. But it was not to be. I will leave you to your thoughts. Come, Mr. Wickham. We are brother and sister, you know. Do not let us quarrel about the past. In the future, I hope we are one mind. <coughs> you are a generous spirit, sister. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
understood the reason for my journey hither. I believe you are mistaken. I cannot account for the honor. However insincere you may choose to be, you will not find me so. My character has been ever celebrated for its sincerity and frankness. I was told that he, your sister was on the point of being most advantageously married, and that you in all likelihood would be united with my own nephew, Mr. Darcy. Though I know it to be a scandalous falsehood, I have arrived to make my sentiments known to you. If you believed it untrue, I wonder you took the trouble of coming so far. To have the report universally contradicted. Can you declare there is no foundation to it? Your ladyship can ask me questions which I shall not choose to answer. Miss Elizabeth, I am unaccustomed to such language at this. I am entitled to know all his dearest concerns. But you are not entitled to know mine. Mr. Darcy is engaged to my daughter. Now what have you to say? Thus you have no reason to believe she would make such an offer to me. But from his early established mother and I planned his union. He is destined for his cousin. But what is that to me? <coughs> if there was no other objection to my marrying your nephew, I should certainly not be kept from it, from knowing his mother and aunt wished him to marry Mr. Burke. Obstinate, headstrong girl! I have not been in the brook habit of such brooking disappointment. <coughs> Tell me once and for all, are you engaged to him? I am not. Do you promise not to enter in such an engagement? I will make no promise of the kind. You have insulted me in every possible method. I must beg to return to the house. Very well, then. I shall now know how to act. Do not expect, Miss Elizabeth, that your admission will be ever gratified. I take no leave of you, and I send no compliments to your mother. I am most seriously displeased. Exactly counterwise to her. I hope you spoke to her quite frankly. 
You know enough of my frankness to believe me capable of that. If I can abuse you so abominably to your face, I could have no scruple in abusing you so much to relations. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say to me that I don't, that I don't deserve? My behaving to you deserve the most severe proof. It was unpardonable. But since then, I hope we have improved in our society. As a child, I was taught what was right, but not to correct my temper. I was given good principles, but left to follow them prior to conceit. By you, I was properly humbled. I came to you without doubt of my reception, but you, dearest, no pieces. You showed me how false were all my pretensions to please along the worthy of being pleased. I'm almost afraid of asking you what you thought of me when we first met at Pemberley. You blamed me for coming. I felt only the pleasure of surprise. My object was to show you by every civility in my power that you were privileged to seen to. How soon any other reasons came to present themselves, I cannot say. But it came up with more than half an hour to seeing you. Other wishes? Other wishes, yes. And Mr. Bingley? Upon my return to London, I told him all that had occurred to make my interference in this affair seem absurd and impertinent. I told him, moreover, that I would leave myself mistaken in believing that your sister was indifferent to him. Having seen that his affection to her was unabated, I have full confidence in their happiness together. Did you speak merely from your own observation and from my information last spring? I had narrowly observed her and was convinced of her affection. And what do you narrowly observe in me, Mr. Darcy? It's something I'm not sure what is expected. <laughs> what have I done? I beg your pardon. You have not yet learned to be laughed at, but I suppose it was too early to be. Pray forgive me. I'm going to speak with your father. <laughs> <laughs>